Got it. All right. Okay. Okay. So, um, rhythmic behaviors and cortex and hippocampus and many other um, brain areas is ubiquitous. And thousands and thousands of papers have been written on synchronization between different electrodes across different areas with different models and you name it, there's been papers about it. Um, larger area recordings and more careful analysis suggests that in fact, um, these rhythms are actually organized into spatio-temporal patterns. Um, and these patterns include plane waves, um, which function of space and they're, they're, they're waves that have a, con a, a straight fronts. Okay, if you want to think of it that way, but they're periodic in this moving variable. Okay, rotating waves, that's another example of the kinds of patterns. Again, they're periodic in that internal thing. Um, R here is the polar radius and theta is the polar angle. So these waves rotate um, at a regular angular speed and also more complex patterns. So um, here's some examples from um, out of, well, Michael Rule was the first author, but this is um, Wilson Truckalo's lab in Brown. This is some monkey motor cortex patterns um, showing um, over here. These are time series. And this is an example of a phase map, okay? Showing basically a synch synchrony and these arrows sort of show the phase gradient, okay? Oop. Um, here's an example of a plane wave. You can see the wave prop. Can you see my little mouse thing? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, here's a radiating wave that starts at the center. You can call it a target wave or something like that. Here's a rotating wave. And here's more complex patterns that involve multiple pinwheels and other things like that. Um, <clears throat> this is out of work of Josh Jacobs lab, who's a collaborator of mine. Um, this is in Neuron 2018. This is- Do you, um, you know where you put the money that I gave you to put back <laughs> in the room? I'm sorry, what? I gave you some, so a bunch of money to put back in the- Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, that wasn't somebody asking a question. It was somebody, Mike was on, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is from Josh Jacobs' lab. Um, I mean, the analysis, these are patients that have um, seizures. And so they got electrodes implanted in parts of their cortex and these are under, this is not a seizure thing. This is just normal ongoing wave. Um, here's an example of the space time plot of that. And you can sort of see a wave that goes from left to right. <clears throat> here's a recent example from um, um, Lyle Muller and other people. Um, this is cortex sleep spindles during um, in humans also. And you can see a rotating wave there zipping around very nicely um, during sleep. And this is in a cortical slice out of um, Zhang Yang Wu. All right, and you can see this little um, target wave, and then quickly it becomes a rotating wave, and you can see it rotating very nicely around that center point. So there we go. So why there? So a natural, and all these examples and many others begin with band tests filtering the local field potential to produce a rhythmic time series. This is Hilbert transformed and then the analytic phase is extracted and phase differences and phase gradients are computed. 
So this suggests a natural framework for this is phase models. And at a phase model, um, each point in space or each point, each oscillator or whatever is represented by a single variable, the phase. And in absence of interactions, this just rotates clock counterclockwise at some frequency omega. And so each time it hits noon, um, it can send out a signal or something like that to all the other guys. And then what we do is we're going to couple these up with all the other phases um, with some sort of coupling matrix, A, J, K, and some interaction function. So I want to say a little bit about phase models. They can be derived mathematically from general weakly coupled oscillators. Um, this interaction function can be experimentally inferred from perturbation experiments of neurons. And so, so that presumably one can actually compute from a given neuron or a given network what this interaction function looks like. Um, you know the uncoupled frequency, presumably, and maybe you know the connectivity. So essentially, phase lock solutions, which is what I'm interested in, satisfy the phase has a constant speed around the circle with some phase shift, all right? And without loss of generality, we always set phi one to be zero because we need to think of things in terms of a relative phase. So a traveling wave might have the form theta j equals omega t minus alpha j, where j is a point in space. Synchrony would just be theta j is omega t. So everybody's doing exactly the same thing. So back in 1992, a long time ago, I, wow, 30 years ago, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I had, I, I derived a sufficient condition for stability of these phase wave. And that is that AJK H prime of the phase differences is greater than or equal to zero for all pairs. That's sufficient, but not necessary, okay? And of course, I have greater than or equal to zero because you might have pairs that aren't coupled. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm not gonna look at discrete stuff. I'm gonna take a continuum limit to obtain a system of oscillators distributed in space. So plane waves essentially are one dimensional structures. So I'm gonna first consider a 1D network. All right, and so here I've switched notation um, in anticipation of going to um, polar coordinates where theta will be at a polar angle. I'm going to use u for the phase now. So u of x t is the phase at any point in space at time t. There is possibly an intrinsic heterogeneity in the natural frequencies. There's going to be an interaction that depends on the distance between two oscillators, phase oscillators, and there is my phase interaction function. And I've introduced the parameter sigma, which is gonna be sort of the width of the interaction, okay? And the second part of the talk, I'm gonna to turn to 2D systems, okay? And in this case, I'm going to assume no heterogeneity, and I'm going to work on an annulus. Okay, and it'll be clear why I'm going to work on an annulus, but I'm going to work on an annulus. Because I'm going to be looking for rotating waves and it's easy to write the equations of an annulus in terms of polar coordinates. So <clears throat> again, H is the phase interaction function. It's two pi periodic. And W is the interaction kernel, and I'm going to assume it's non-negative. So if h of zero is zero and h prime of zero is greater than zero, then in all and <clears throat> then u is omega t is asymptotically stable to the, the homogeneous network. So without any kind of heterogeneities um, in arbitrary dimensions, if w is a positive non-negative kernel and h prime of zero is positive, then synchrony is always an asymptotically stable solution to this. So <clears throat> without 
phase um, without heterogeneities or the development of some sort of um, singularities, we're always going to get synchronization. So the first thing I want to talk about are heterogeneity driven patterns. And in particular, I want to look for frequency gradients where omega of x is not constant. There's a couple of ways to get frequency gradients. I mean, there's a couple of ways to get heterogeneities. One is frequency gradients. Another is conduction delays. So H of phase difference becomes H of phase difference minus alpha times difference between um, X and X distance, okay? Where alpha is frequency divided by velocity. And finally, if H of zero is not zero, then you get edge effects and boundary effects. So those are three different ways to get heterogeneities. The other kinds of ways to get patterns is topological patterns. Topological patterns arise from phase singularities. For example, a ring of oscillators, so that's an oscill a bunch of oscillators in a ring has a rotating wave solution or a traveling wave solution, which is stable if the ring is large enough. But I'm mostly going to focus on 2D rotating waves. So first, let's look at 1D, all right? So du dt is omega of x plus this um, kernel. And I'm introducing several, there's several interesting parameters I'm going to put in here, all right? One is sigma, that's the space scale the connectivity scale. Alpha is sort of the degree of conduction velocity. So if alpha is zero, the conduction velocity is infinite. <clears throat> and B is a parameter that takes me away from pure sine coupling. And if gamma is one, then H of zero is zero. And if gamma is not one and B is not zero, then H of zero is not zero, okay? So I want you to keep those parameters in mind. So what I'm gonna show here is a couple of different plots, okay? Some of these plots, the red one is the actual phase and this black and green one are phase gradients. So that's the derivative of the phase with respect to, to space, all right? With respect to X, Without loss of generality, I'm on zero one, and I'm varying three. I'm fixing h of u to be sine of u plus 0.5 minus sine 0.5. So you can see h of zero is zero. Okay, and I'm playing around with two things: the conduction velocity and the the space constant. All right, so here. I get a nice sort of parabolic phase profile when alpha is two and sigma is 0.5. Um, this is the same thing, the phase gradient, this is blue. And if I make sigma get smaller, you can see that this green curve appears to be um, converging to the blue curve or the blue curve seems to be converging to the green curve. There's not a whole lot of difference between this. It looks like this is converging. Here I've increased alpha and kept sigma to be 0.02 and you can see it develops a, a bigger gradient, okay? So now let's start with an approximation, okay? In this particular case, when H of zero is zero, U and UX tend to O of one limits as sigma goes to zero. Um, and omega goes to O of sigma. So if I rewrite this, I'm making that onsatz, if I rewrite the um, integral, just to change of variables um, in terms of eta, then I can do a perturbation in sigma, all right, for small sigma. And I, I end up getting a simple ODE that some of you will recognize. Omega one is H prime of zero nu two times VX plus H double prime nu two V squared plus alpha squared. And this is just a nonlinear, very simple nonlinear 
ODE that you can prove existence to. Um, in fact, you can solve it with shooting. And these are the boundary conditions. And that turns out to work um, really well as an approximation to this. The, the approximation works great. It's a really easy calculation and it's pretty straightforward because H of zero is zero. However, if H of zero is, oh, now frequency gradients, I'm still using H of zero is zero. <clears throat> and what you find is as sigma gets smaller, okay? I introduced the frequency gradient here. As sigma gets smaller, you start to see what's called in, in the literature, a boundary layer. So in the gradients here, you start to see edge effects, even though H of zero is zero, okay? <clears throat> boundary effects are much more dramatic and considerably harder to solve. Here you can see if H is just sine of U, H of zero is non-zero. There's no phase gradient here. Nope. And you can see this sort of interior layer and then these boundary layers at the edge. So what happens is large over one over sigma gradients develop, and this is a much, <clears throat> much harder problem. So what you can do, I'm not gonna go through the algebra because I mean, it's complicated. What you can do is rescale sigma ux to v of x. So v of x is O of one, but u of x is O of one over sigma. So that grows. And the outer equation is just an algebraic equation. And unfortunately, there's boundary layers at both ends, and there's no progress that I've made um, on this except for um, very special kernels where I can convert this to an ODE. So I'll just stop there at this point with the 1D and say the problem is difficult, and there's still some open questions. Hold on, I'm gonna get a drink of water here. There, I want to see if there's anybody there. I can't see people. Oh, I better close that because then you can't see my slides. All right, so I'm gonna turn now to rotating waves, okay? So I'm gonna work on the annulus due to its rotational symmetry. Um, I can shrink the hole as needed. So this is a little more general than a disk. So I'm gonna let X be R theta, X prime be S phi, then R squared is X squared, X minus X prime squared, <clears throat> the absolute value of that. And that turns out to be R squared is little R squared plus S squared minus two R S cosine of the phase difference. So this, so we end up with this integral differential equation in 2D in polar coordinates, where little a is the inner radius and b is the outer radius of the annulus. Phase lock solutions have a very simple form. U of r theta t is omega t plus v of r theta. So we have to solve this interesting functional equation, which is hopeless. However, um, oh, incidentally, I can set omega equals zero without loss of generality. However, if we're looking for rotating waves, n-armed rotating waves satisfy u of r theta t is omega t plus n theta plus f of r. And they satisfy, in particular, synchrony is n equals zero and f equals zero and u equals zero, and that's stable as long as h prime w is positive. For n greater than zero, we have the following algebraic equation. It's an integral equation of the, it's a Fredholm integral equation of the first kind, okay? And those are notoriously difficult to solve. <clears throat> However, we will solve it. Um, and Wn is this complicated integral um, of the interaction function with the 
phase interaction function. So this is a nonlinear functional equation for f of r with f of a is zero. <clears throat> now, if h is an odd function, then omega is zero and f of r is zero because this integral vanishes. This is an even function of phi. This is an odd function. So everything vanishes. So from now on, I'm going to set n equal one. And I'm going to consider an odd function first, not from now on, but I'm going to first consider an odd function. And I'm going to ask about stability. So we have existence. Existence is real easy. U is theta. Okay. So we linearize around that and we get this linear equation, linear integral equation. And I plug in v is psi of r e to the i m theta plus lambda m t. And I find a nice eigenvalue equation where these kms are complicated functions. If w is a Gaussian and h is sine, then these things are just Bessel functions. And we get this nice integral equation. And here's an example of a solution for even for odd h. Yeah, you can see it's a nice rotating wave. And let's go back to the stability. All right. This looks like a matrix equation, right? Just looks like an infinite dimensional matrix equation. Think of these as matrices. And there's this big diagonal term. So when I see a big diagonal term, the first thing I think of is the gersh goren circle theorem. Um, is there anybody out here um, who knows that theorem? You're trying to find the eigenvalues? Like yeah, yeah find the eigenvalues of a matrix that is diagonally dominant. <laughs> if all the eigenvalues are negative and bigger in magnitude than everything else, then it's easy to prove all the eigenvalues have negative real parts. So basically, we have a really simple, we, we can generalize that to this integral equation. If k of zero is bigger than the magnitude of km, then eigenvalues are negative. And this is really easy to check because you can just compute these um, using maple or mathematic or whatever, and then you can check them. Okay, and it turns out that only m equals one is problematic. There's a stronger result too, which if I integrate this over s, then this is a little weaker assumption than this one. Then also I get um, stability. And one interesting question is, is there instability? And it turns out if A and B, the inner radius is small and the outer radius is small, so that's a thin, tiny little annulus, then you can prove the real part of lambda N is greater than zero. So you can show instability, okay? So I'm gonna show you some examples in, in a second. Um, if H of phi is sine phi and WR is Gaussian, then these integrals are combinations of Bessel functions. And for m greater than one, km is less than k naught. So only m equals one is dangerous. So what we do is we discretize um, k10 and use MATLAB to find the eigenvalues of the corresponding matrix, okay? So what we find is for fixed b, that's the outer radius, there's a minimal inner radius such that if the inner radius is less than a critical, then it's unstable. And I'm going to compare these curves that we get numerically with various analytic approximations. So there they are. All right. So Gersh Gorin, pretty boring. Okay. This, this is sufficient condition for stability, but doesn't give us instability. Improved Gersh Gorin gives us a bigger range of sufficient stability. And it starts to look a little bit curvy there. This is critical A versus B, the outer radius. Narrow annulus theory gives us better stuff. 
Here's what the numerics gives us. So basically along this purple curve, anywhere, any, any annulus that has A and B out here gives a stable, rigid, rotating wave. And any in here is unstable. So here's an example of a movie. There, okay? So that, I'll show it to you again. Notice it's a really skinny annulus, <laughs> all right? The outer radius is two and the inner radius is really small and it goes to synchrony. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip this part. Um, if you add some sine two phi, you can change the, the um, radius of stability. You can make things more or less stable. What about general H? That's much harder, okay? If H of phi is, so here's how I'm gonna prove this, all right? So there's some people out here that know math, right? I mean, there's some math guys here, is that true? <laughs> or not? A little bit. Uh, is there anybody that's heard of the implicit function theorem? Yes. Okay, good, good. Because that's what I use here, all right? So the implicit function theorem is the applied mathematician's best friend. And it's also the great truth in all of applied math. All of applied math, we can only solve things when something's small or something's linear, okay? Everything else is just approximations. So. I'm going to write h of phi as little h of phi comma p, where p is a parameter. For example, and, and I'm gonna suppose, for example, that h of phi comma zero is an odd function, okay? Because we know how to solve the odd function and we've proven the existence for odd functions. So we need to solve this functional equation. So when p is zero, omega equals f of r equals zero. So we have a solution, that's our base solution. And we have a theorem. Suppose there's a P naught and omega naught and F naught of R such that this guy has a solution, all right? And suppose that this integral is positive, okay? Then there exists an interval P1, P2 containing P naught such that there's a solution to star for all P in that interval. And basically what we do is we solve the resulting nonlinear functional equation using iteration or with Newton's method. And here's some examples, what, not, not, what that non-odd part does, all right? So it's not, it's still H of zero, zero, but it's a non-odd function, all right? So what I'm showing here is F of R. Remember F of R is, these are the isophase lines, okay? So F of R shows that if F of R is zero, the isophase lines are straight curves. So F of R is sort of the curvature. For example, if F of R was R, we'd have a straight up Archimedean spiral, okay? Remember? Theta equals R. That's the Archimedean spiral. Remember that from calculus? Okay, none of you probably remember calculus because you're all old, okay? But if you remember calculus, so these are almost Archimedean spirals because you could see F of R is almost a straight line except that the boundaries where it bends, okay? And what I'm increasing here is that parameter D which is the evenness. And you can see that it gets more spirally. So here's an example with D equals one on an annulus of one to 10. Here's D equals one on an annulus of two to 10. And here's D equals one on an annulus of two to 20. So you can see that these are not geometrically similar. There's still a lot more twist. So the smaller D is, the smaller the radius is, the, the steeper that spiral is. In fact, that spiral goes to infinity as the inner radius goes to zero. 
And here's some examples of omega, the net, the ensemble frequency, and f at the endpoint, that's the f at this end, as a function of d, as a function of the twist. And you can see that as the twist gets bigger, okay, that omega gets bigger. And as a gets smaller, you can see that f of b grows at a power law with A, okay? As this is the log log plot. And as the inner radius gets small, F of B is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, okay? Like a power law. So that means that the twist of the spiral is getting more and more intense. Stability again is much harder numerically and analytically, but we can say that if the inner radius is large enough, and the even part is small enough, the wave is stable. We find numerically that solutions are lost at an apparent saddle node bifurcation. As D increases, the uh, evenness increases for fixed A and B or for fixed evenness as A decreases. And we manually compute the critical value of D as a function of A for different values of B. All right, and there they are. So basically, everywhere in this region is a stable spiral, and there's a saddle node along here. And then out here, the spiral doesn't exist anymore. All right, the rigid spiral doesn't exist. We'll see some really cool stuff happens there. So the main points, if the inner radius is small enough, then the rigid rotating wave is unstable. We've conjectured that as A decreases, the inner radius decreases, there's a saddle node. So what happens beyond that? To answer this, what we do is solve the full integral equation on an annulus, okay? So here's some examples of solutions. This is the case with the odd case, and we've seen that this is a um, snapshot in time, and you can see that the wave is disappearing and eventually synchrony will completely take over. Here we have a substantial even part, and the inner radius is 0.2 and the outer radius is 5. And you can see what happens is this weird little instability in the core, near the core of the spiral develops. If we shrink the, um, if we shrink D, then that restabilizes. Or if we keep D this and make the hole bigger, it restabilizes. So you can see these two kinds of bi these bifurcations here. Good, good, stable, rigid, rotating waves. Make D bigger, loses stability. Make A smaller, loses stability. And does anybody here, has anybody here heard of a saddle node infinite cycle bifurcation? AKA a SNCC. No, no SNCC people. It, all right, here, here's the simplest example of a SNCC, okay? My favorite example. My favorite example of a SNCC, if you take, if you bring a male firefly into a dark room and start flashing a light at him, he will sit and train to that, okay? All right, so you got that entrainment. Can anybody see me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay, so you can see my little hand motions, okay? So I get entrainment. And then what happens if I change the frequency a little bit and I lose entrainment, I get what, something called phase slipping. So I'm, I'll stay synchronized, but then I'll zip around, I'll, I'll race ahead and then come back, okay? That's called phase slip, okay? And that's the simplest example of a saddle node infinite cycle. And that's what happens here, but here it's self phase slipping because what's happening is 
that on this ring, okay, on this ring, the oscillators out here want to go a different frequency than the oscillators in here. Now they're coupled through the radius, but what happens is if that frequency difference that these guys want to go is too big relative to their, the, the, if it gets too big, you'll get face slip and the guys in the middle will start to slip away. And here's an example, all right? There's a movie. And so you can see this little, do you see the little sparkly stuff? Okay. So that it's no longer a rigid rotating wave. It is a rotating wave, but with some asynchronous behavior around the core. Here's another example. And this gets more intense. And the actual core of the wave breaks off from there and then joins back up. So you get this really complicated dynamics. What I've done here is, oh, it's not, the top isn't changing. I don't know why that is. All right, and here's another example where, again, I get this asynchronous behavior in the middle and it's gonna break off and become synchronous. So these are all examples of something that was recently discovered, I'd say recently in the last 20 years called spiral chimeras, all right? So in the Fitzunagumo, all right, with strong, this is a Fitzunagumo with strong coupling, you can see nice regular rotating spiral waves and everything at the core is pretty cool. But if the coupling gets weak, you can see this instability at the core and this asynchronous behavior. Um, here's an example of the Belyusov Shabatinsky reagent of a um, spiral chimera also. Okay? In all these cases, the coupling is non-local. Okay? So chimeras were named by Steve Strogatz. They're a mixture of coherent and incoherent regions in arrays of coupled oscillators. In typical examples, the core is incoherent while the surrounding area shows characteristics of a rigid rotating wave. By restricting our analysis to the annulus, what we've effectively done is surgery and we've removed the incoherent core. However, as we put that core back, there is a SNCC, a saddle node infinite cycle, and the rigid wave no longer exists. So here's an example of the bifurcation. This is with no hole. The hole is zero, and we get this nice. So now we're opening up the hole. We're making it bigger. Making it bigger still, there's still a little incoherent. And finally, we've cut out the incoherent region, and we get a nice straight rigid rotating wave, okay? Kernels matter, okay? That is to say, the type of interaction matters. So here's, I'm, I'm gonna show four examples of kernels. One is a Gaussian, one is an exponential, one is a Lorentzian, okay? That's, that goes like one over distance squared. And one is Lorentzian squared, which goes like the distance four, all right? And what you see is both the Lorentzian and the exponential become unstable. The same diet, the same, all the parameters are the same. All that's different are the kernels. These guys can maintain a rigid rotating wave with a hole. This hole has a diameter of one, okay? But these guys can't. And that's because the reach of the exponential, the exponential and the Lorentz one decay too slowly as a function of distance. Now you might say, wait a second, the exponential decays faster than one over X to the fourth. That's true for X large enough, but we're only talking about X sort of on the order of 
two to three. And then the exponential is still slower or slower than X to the fourth and the Gaussian. And it's because there are these phase gradients here and you want to couple, you're coupling over a distance. If you couple to guys that are too far away from you phase wise, they want to push you out of phase with them. And so that causes this instability. So now I want to turn back to biology, okay? And ask a question, what purpose could plane waves serve, okay? Why would we care about plane waves? So I've shown several mechanisms for the generation of phase waves. Um, rotating waves far enough out look like plane waves. And as with rhythms such as gamma, beta, one can ask what possible utility could traveling waves serve in perception? memory or other functions. Well, a couple of years ago, Stuart Heitman, he was a postdoc of mine, and I suggested that waves could aid in motion detection. And more recently, the Josh Jacobs lab has shown a connection between traveling wave directionality and memory encoding. So Stuart Heitman and I came up with a following simple model. We have a network of excitatory cells and inhibitory cells. We have two networks, okay? And these networks under normal circumstances will generate something called a bump attractor. However, what we do is we offset the kernels in the top part, the top network slightly, and we offset the bottom one slightly in another direction. So instead of a bump attractor, we get a moving bump, okay? the offset kernels make this bump move, all right? And so this is a network of two different kernels. And now the input is J of X, T. And you can see it is a, a gradient, a moving gradient. And one it moves in one direction and this it moves in the other. Population one responds, population two doesn't respond. Similarly, population one doesn't respond to this one. Population two does respond. And if the gradient, um, if, there's, if it's synchronous, in other words, it's not a moving gradient, neither of these guys respond except weakly. So that's one possible application of traveling waves. More recently, um, Uma Mohan, who is a, um, postdoc with Josh Jacobs, um, they published this paper on the archive that did this memory encoding task where you had to learn, the patient had to learn some words, okay, and remember them. And what they found is that the patient was much better at encoding, learning a word when the, memory, when, when the waves were going from occipital to frontal. In other words, if waves went from visual cortex to prefrontal cortex direction, then they were much better at memorizing a visually shown word. So I had an, a, a, a student this summer at Woods Hole and we decided to take a Wilson-Cowan network. So here's our Wilson-Cowan network. And the Wilson-Cowan network is excitable. See, it's set up as an excitable system. Do you guys know, everybody know what excitable means? Or does anybody know what excitable means? Excitable is like a toilet, all right? So you can think of a toilet, if you put water into it, if you pour water into a toilet, you can induce it to flush, all right? So you've crossed the threshold. So imagine if, and, but then there's a refractory period and you can't flush it again. So neuron is equivalent to a, tight, a toilet, an excitable system. So imagine if you couple a whole string of toilets together and you let the water from one pour into the water to the other guys. Then if you flush one toilet, that will induce all the others to flush as a pulse wave, all right? So there is, so what we've done is we set up this Wilson-Cowan network to generate a pulse wave if it's stimulated. However, we've made the coupling 
such that it doesn't quite make a wave. It can't generate a pulse wave. So instead, what we do is we now add on top of that a periodic wave train. And you can see that lightly here, all right? And now what it does is that periodic wave boosts enough, it, it gives enough of a boost so that information can propagate from this side to the other. Um, if the wave goes the wrong direction, information doesn't happen. And if the wave is going too fast or too slow, information doesn't happen. And in between, really cool stuff happens. So basically, um, I'm going to finish up. Is that OK? Um, cortical. So this, this provides a possible reason that traveling waves could be useful. They could help boost signals from one end of the cortex to the other. Okay, so conclusions and outlook, cortical LFP is organized into spatiotemporal patterns, including plane and rotating waves. Using spatially distributed phase models lets us get some insight into possible mechanism for these waves. <clears throat> In one and two dimensions, phase gradients can arise through heterogeneities or topological singularities. We prove an existence and stability of rotating waves in the annulus if the hole is big enough. We suggest that spiral chimeras are born via a SNCC as the hole shrinks. Um, Koromoto and Shino, this is recent stuff, or old stuff, suggest coupling strength, their old paper, matters. So perhaps instability disappears if we include amplitude. Um, and finally, it's not here in the conclusions, I suggested some possible utility of traveling waves in cognitive and perceptual um, um, cortical operation. So acknowledgments, um, National Science Foundation, Yuji Ding was a PhD student. She did all the work on um, rotating waves. Um, Andrea Welsh and Stuart Heitman. Andrea Welsh did the stuff on 1D waves with phase gradients. Stuart Heitman um, did the waves and um, um, motion detection. And Yi Chin Lu was a methods and computational neuroscience student at NYU, um, did the simulations and the analysis of the traveling waves boosting the um, regular propagating waves. So I will stop here. Um, oh, this is just, I got lots of perturbation theory if anybody's interested. All right, you can unmute yourselves now. <laughs> Hiya, Gary. Any questions? Oh, if you have questions, you should probably unmute yourself. <laughs> I'd like to tell everybody a joke that Bard told me years ago. Uh-oh. What's oh. this? Oh! <laughs> the, the Fourier transform of this. <laughs> All right, I will tell you an improved version. What's okay. this? Okay. Before you have a transform of this. <laughs> okay. All right. So we we had a question in the um, in the um, in the chat about what's a SNCC. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen now because I can write on. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Saddle node bifurcation on a periodic circle. Let me I'll, I'll illustrate it very easily to you. My white, can you see my whiteboard? Yeah. Yep. All right. Bear with me while I draw. Okay. This is a differential equation on a circle, okay? 
And there's two equilibrium points, a stable one and an unstable one. This is one of the simplest models of an excitable system. If I'm starting, suppose I start at the saddle node or the stable fixed point, and I give a little perturbation. I'm going to change colors here to get the perturbation. Okay. I give a little perturbation that not very big. It takes me back and I go back. So I don't get much of a response. I just get boom and I go back. But suppose I give a bigger perturbation that takes me past here, then I have to go all the way around here before I come back. And that gives rise to an action potential, okay? So that's, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add a current to this, to this system. I'm gonna add a constant system. I'm, I'm gonna add, so I'm going to add like constant drive to this. And what that constant drive does sorry, is it brings these two equilibrium points closer and closer together. Here's an easy way to look at it. There's my periodic function and there's my equilibrium points. I've unwrapped the circle. And now I'm gonna add a constant which is gonna lift this curve up. And once it's lifted up past this line, these two equilibrium points come together and there's nothing left. And I just drift around like this, okay? And that bifurcation where these two guys come together and leave a periodic solution, that's a snick. Exactly right, Nigel, yes. So did that help? Oh. What's the implication of um, this annulus? Because you, you don't have a hole in the middle of your brain. So- Okay, you're right, you're right, okay. So I put that there for mathematical convenience, okay? But- in reality, we can get ro we can get rotating waves in without the annulus. You can get them on a domain. However, it turns out that the phase waves that you get, just a phase model, so rotating waves don't exist unless you've got purely odd coupling as you shrink the hole. They just don't exist anymore. However, and this is recent work, if you now put some meat on the phase model, so instead of looking at a pure phase model, you add some amplitude. For example, um, I'll share my screen again. Uh, let's clear all this. Um, Okay, this is a standard simple model for a limit cycle, okay? Where R is the amplitude of the limit cycle. So if you couple a bunch of these guys up in space and make the coupling large enough, then you can shrink the hole to zero and you can get rotating waves over the hole. You don't, you don't have a hole. So the hole is mathematical convenience, Nigel. Yeah, I've got a question if you finished answering the, the previous one. Um, I wanted to know how your results change, if at all, uh, by introducing stochasticity. You probably won't be surprised to hear this question from me. Oh, so wait, what's the question? How, how the results get changed if you in, include well, stochasticity? Okay, well, because they're asymptotically stable, um, yeah. if you add mild stochasticity, then it will persist. 
right. But, I, I, but I'm thinking more. I'm thinking more about intri- I'm thinking more about intrinsic stochasticity as opposed to ah, uh, additive noise. Ex- external. Okay. So, for example, if you modeled the wilson cowan equations instead as a series of zero and one. Yeah, that, like that. yeah. Well, just look like in my work with Jack Cowan. Yeah, I don't actually know what would happen in that case, except that obviously, I th- I think as for a sufficiently large n, that is your your mean field, then then the the variance is again it's still not that strong a noise. What happens if the noise gets too big? is it goes to the deepest attractor, which is synchrony, okay? So synchrony is sort of the global attractor here. Yeah. It really, And if you add enough noise, it will synchronize. Right. Now, well, in the case of the phase gradients, where there's heterogeneities anyway, um, those are pretty robust to noise. However, um, you'll probably get like chaotic behavior or something. I don't know what you'll have, what will happen in those cases. Um, right. I mean, you, what, I, what I might expect is that there's going to be a spontaneous excitation of these traveling waves, for example, right? Oh, okay, yes. Okay, but you, you have to keep in mind that my network is intrinsically oscillatory, okay? Right, so, that's true, I see, yes. Okay, it's intrinsically oscillatory, so noise will just mess with the limit cycle but it won't but, but, but even, so if you didn't have a, an intrinsic if you didn't sort of put the oscillatory nature in by hand as it were i, I guess you could still excite these waves. oh yeah you absolutely could and in fact you can get nice rotating waves in wilson cowan equations yeah when they're in the excitable regime but the reason i use these intrinsic oscillatory things is that what the experimentalists are doing is recording uh, local field potential. This is intrinsically oscillatory. So the the ground model here, or the the Occam's razor, um, is that it's an intrinsically oscillatory medium. Yeah, yeah, and you're far from any bifurcation points. So yeah. Now it's interesting you point that out because you can homotopy these phase models into excitable models very easily. And so it really becomes very difficult to distinguish. If you just see a rotating wave, it's impossible to tell whether the medium underlying it is excitable or oscillatory just by looking at that. You need you need to be able to do other probes. Liz. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, you're not finished yet. Go on. No, 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 I'm finished. I, uh, I, the next person can ask the question. Liz. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm curious about in your last slide before your conclusions in the biological uh, example. In the bottom left-hand corner, you had some lines that were like not going along the slope, but kind of Oh, 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 this, this. Uh, no. Yeah, that, right here. Yeah, yeah. yeah the that, bottom right. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, it's a really cool, um, <laughs> we don't understand it completely, but we have sort of an idea. It's kind of like, um, okay, so, um, you can think of these pulses as surfing the, you, you have a wave pool. Here's a way to think of it. You have a wave pool, okay? <laughs> and okay. You, and your, your intrinsic medium wants to go at a certain velocity, okay? Mm-hmm. So you can, if, if the wave pool's velocity is close to your, velocity, then you can stay on it and you just get that nice smooth propagating wave. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if it's way off, you'll just fall off the wave and die. Okay. Drown. Okay. But if it's, there's a transition there where it's 
you kind of catch up and then slow down and catch up and slow down. And it, it, there's a bifurcation and instability, which we don't completely understand yet. Um, and, and the reason we don't understand it is it was a two week summer project in August. <laughs> is it anyway. similar to, is it similar to when you have with sound, if there's two frequencies that are very, or two notes that are very close in frequency, but a little bit different, then you get the like wavering of the tone. Is it like well, that? It's a little like that. It's a little like that where you, it's not quite like, no, it's not really like beating, okay? okay? It's not like a beat frequency. It's more like a slip and catch, slip and catch. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. All right. Ab Abhinav? Hi, Bart. I had a question about the Heisman model, where you were showing that you could selectively filter out one gradient versus the other gradient. So is there a different part of your population that latches on, or is the whole population sort of oscillating with one gradient or the selected gradient? Wait, say it again. So um, if you could go back to the Heitman model, how, which, which oscillators oh, let me, are... Um, let me, oh, shoot, what did I just do? Hold on, I gotta go, I gotta share my screen again here. Okay, here we go. This? Yeah, so when you were selecting either, let's say the, the top grating or the, you know, the second grating, is the whole network doing the selection or only a subset of the population sort of, you know, okay. oscillates to do that? Only the top guy responds to one direction and only the bottom guy responds to the other and the inhibition suppresses the guy that is better tuned. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. In the first part, you had um, you had uh, basically two different um, stability curves, like they were able to like T something one and T something two. Oh, thin mm -hmm. narrow annulus one, narrow annulus two. Yeah, there's two. Was different Different radii or different approximations? No, they're or different those? approximations. They're different. One, one is one that you get from perturbation theory, and the other is kind of gluing the perturbation theory together to get kind of a more global thing. Um, so they're both, you know, one is sort of an approximation. One is an even cruder approximation than the other, but it turns out to be more accurate. <laughs> Why weren't they better, do you think? Um, oh, oh, wait, wait, let's see. What, let me go back to. Let's see, where is it? Where was that? I gotta find that picture. Oh, that's, that's at the very beginning, that's right. Can't get, there, there. All right, I'm sure I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, what's the question then? <laughs> um, so I, I guess, you know, why, why don't you think they've like... TA2 is pretty good. Yeah, TA2 is very good. Okay. Okay, I think that was really it. Yeah, TA2 is pretty good. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with TA2. I mean... <laughs> Well, what's what's like a what's a more sophisticated approach? Is there is there a way to turn a crank and get to a TA three? No, I don't. I mean, maybe there is, but um, I mean, these get pretty they get pretty ugly pretty quick. Um, let's see if I. Uh, here's is this a narrow annulus one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't, yeah, it gets a lot of terms. Uh, <laughs> there's also the, large, the the really cool thing is the large hole approximation. That works really well too. Um, I don't know how much physics you guys know, um, but there's a very famous 
equation called Berger's equation, okay? Comes up in fluid dynamics a lot. Anybody heard of Berger's equation? Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> it comes up in a lot of places. How about Kuramoto Shivashinsky? Have you ever heard of that? Okay, <laughs> well, anyway, um, large hole approximation actually works pretty well for not for stability, but it works for getting the shape of the waves pretty well. Um, um, I didn't show that because it's a lot of, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's perturbation theory. It was, <laughs> if you want to see all the details, you can check out the paper in SIADS. It's about 30 or 40 pages. Siam so, Journal of Applied Dynamical Systems. Um, UG, D I N G is the first author, but if you look for Ding and Ehrman Trout, you can't miss it. <laughs> so, are you, are you saying that in a large hole approximation, it essentially becomes like a one dimensional um, sliver, and then the, the equation that describes the wave is just basically Actually, chaos? What happens is if the circle gets big, it's sort of equivalent to the sigma the space constant of the connectivity getting small. And then uh -huh. you can kind of do a, you, you can approximate it as a set of ODEs. And then those ODEs turn out to be really easy to, you, you, it, it's basically Berger's equation on an annulus. <laughs> and you can write down all exact solutions in terms of Bessel functions. So what, what is it? So, so, but is it a 2D Berger's equation or 1D Berger's? It's the 2D burgers. 2D, okay. So there's, so there's no shock. We end up doing what? what? So, there, so there's shocks or not? No, there's no shocks because yeah, it's 2D. It, well, it's also no shocks because um, there's there's a nice F. I mean, it, there's plenty of um, diffusion. No, so, so, there's, so there's a viscosity regularizer on the right Yeah, hand. there's a lot of viscosity. It, the, 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 the Berger's part, the F prime, the, the derivative squared part, the coefficient of that is the even part. So that completely goes away when there's no even part in the interaction function. I see. Thank you. Um, so the, the, you had the, the cool, like the weird flicker or, or um, non-rotate rotary motion that happens right around the hole. Do you see things, do you see traces of that in actual, um, in any neural waves or? Not that I know of. I mean, <laughs> the, 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 you know, if you look at the, if you look at my, here, let's see, let me go back to here. Be really cool if you did, but um, <laughs> who knows what that implicate? Would that would that would that imply that there is an annulus around the thing, or that like? No, I, I, you can get these. All, oh, here, I, I'm going to show you another simulation. Okay. Okay. I'm going to show you a cool simulation. This is these these are really cool simulations. Give me a second here. Am I sharing my screen? Nope. What? Just a second. I got to do everything command line because that's what I do. Mm -hmm. I'm old enough that that's all I know. <laughs> I believe that we evolved language so we didn't have to ooh, ooh, point. <laughs> Crap only one of it. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, can you see that? Yes. All right, so I'm going to find it here. And Oh, here, wait, let me first do this.
Okay. Oh, oh wait. I screwed something up here. Okay. Nice rotating wave. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 hold on. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I'm going to make this a little smaller. All right, there is a nice rotating wave, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and th this is just a this is a discrete system in space, and it's just north, south, east, west coupling. Okay, and all I'm going to do is increase that non-odd part, all right, of the interaction function. Okay, now you saw what happened earlier because I had it too big. Here it is at point six. Okay, up oh, there, there. So now that's sort of without the hole, <laughs> these guys are kind of asynchronous and you get this little, um, <laughs> little funny little wiggling thing, right? But now this is really crazy. In fact, I think I, I want to make some sort of gambling game on this. <laughs> You'll see why. I think. So here's the, here's the goal. Gam here's the gambling. Which which side will it fall off? Because <laughs> once that once that spiral goes off the edge, it goes to synchrony. I have no explanation for this. It's such a simple model, and yet um, <laughs> it's just nearest neighbor coupling. Coupling is sine of x plus a times one minus cosine of x. That's of the phase difference. So this is what happens without the, oh, oh, oh is it gonna go off the side? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I could watch this for, I, I really enjoy watching these. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think if you look, the, the electrode spacing is so crude that you wouldn't be able to see that, that kind of detail in the cases where it's frozen. Or in the cases here. I wonder if I can put some, put some noise in for Nigel. <laughs> yeah. And I did put too much in, but. <laughs> Doesn't affect it much. Anyway, <laughs> so the the point of that was to show you that what without a hole, the behavior at the core becomes really complicated, and these spirals wander around. And that's seen in chemical reactions too. That's actually seen in the Bell Yusov Jabotinsky, but I don't think it's ever been. I don't know if it's been seen in. The, the, the best one would be like a cortical slice, like one of the things I showed you earlier. Those large scale brain recordings, no. But the voltage sensitive dye stuff has very high resolution. And, but the problem is that you wouldn't be, you probably wouldn't be able to distinguish that kind of, any kind of complexity from basic fact that the cortex is not isotro homogeneous. There's heterogeneities. So this is more for a mathematical amusement only. Do you, need other... to, do you need to do anything special to handle the, heterogen, the real heterogeneities that you would expect or how would you? You could do it as a perturbation. Okay. But, you know, as I said, the great, thing they don't tell you in applied math is we can only do things if there's an epsilon around. Well, thank you so much for presentation. Any other I, questions? I'm sorry this is so mathematical. I don't I wasn't sure, but yeah. It's a little mathematical, but I enjoyed it. All right. Well thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. And uh everybody, anybody who's still around next week, 
Aaron Mukamel will be talking about um, uh, uh, genomics for cell identity types in neurons. Okay, bye. Okay, bye.